Okay, so welcome back to Humanistic Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be the third one in a series dedicated to Rollo May, Psychology and the Human Dilemma. So in the last video, what did we do in the last video? We were looking at chapters two and three out of the book. That's right, and we got through all of those. So that sets us up for chapter 12. So skipping ahead in the book a little bit to chapter 12, freedom and responsibility re-examined. Okay, so probably the first thing you ought to know about chapter 12 and about uh, existential approaches to psychology generally is they tend to place a lot of weight on the interplay between freedom and responsibility. Moreover, they tend to see freedom and responsibility as integral to one another, really so much so that ultimately they're just different aspects of the very same phenomenon. And of course the phenomenon is life as we know it, human existence. So to be human is to be both free and both responsible for our freedom. So uh, freedom and responsibility re-examined. Now, uh, a lot of this chapter, or at least the beginning parts of it, is dedicated to a kind of cultural critique and more specifically to the way that we tend to see freedom within our Western and probably more specifically American culture. And according to Rollo May, there are two basic ways that we fail to see freedom and also responsibility in an accurate way. Okay, so two prevailing distortions in the meaning of freedom. So let's go through these one by one to give you an idea about them. So the first one is called the full freedom assumption. And it's basically the idea that there are no, or at least that there should be no, or at least very few limits or boundaries or rules regarding our practice of freedom. That really what freedom is about, uh, or at least should be about, is getting whatever it is you want, whenever it is you want it. Okay, so it's a more or less in infantile vision of what freedom and the constructs that derive from freedom, like decisions and choices and all of that kind of stuff. That ultimately it's about getting whatever it is you want, whenever it is you want it. All right, so <laughs> the problem, of course, is that this vision of freedom is uh, not consistent with reality. Okay, so the reality of human freedom is it's a, it's a way of responding exactly to the limits of life. So human freedom is not about some sort of state of limitlessness. It's about uh, the range that we have to decide for ourselves how we're going to respond to the limits of life. In other words, limitation and freedom mutually define one another. Okay, And of course responsibility is in the equation too. But right now let's focus on uh, limitation and freedom. And I've noticed this, uh, maybe you've noticed this too, uh, within advertising, this kind of playing upon this particular uh, view of what freedom, not what it is, but what people fantasize it about being. I think that's a sentence. Okay, so, um, uh, and I've noticed this came about, how long ago was it? Like maybe about, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. There was a a kind of swelling up within advertising, product advertising, of using these kinds of slogans as, uh, you know, advertising for, well, just about any product. That's the great thing about it. It's sort of like a skeleton key. You can almost any advertise any product by just saying, no limits. So, you know, like, um, well, since we're in the midst of the coronavirus, uh, Charmin bathroom tissue, no limits, man. You know, or any other goofball product you want to sort of do that. Like, no rules, no limits, one size fits all advertise. So, so uh, well, why am I bringing that up? Because not only does it exemplify this idea of Rollo Mays that we fairly often have this distorted full freedom assumption idea about what freedom is, but it also illustrates the fact that it's a bit virulent with respect to the cultural, cultural terrain that we inhabit, that it propagates it across, that this idea lives and breathes within us. You see, advertisers wouldn't have slogans like that if they didn't know that this idea was appealing to us somehow. And by the way, there are some very, very bright people, very psychologically astute people within advertising. So never underestimate what's going on in advertising. Okay, so... <laughs> 
All right, so the first problem is that this vision of freedom is not actually consistent with reality. Okay, it's a fantasy-driven vision of freedom. But more importantly, according to Rollo May, it generates a self-absorbed infantile attitude. You see, when you think that freedom is about getting everything you want, whenever you want it, however you want it, irrespective of the uh, realities of the world that you're inhabiting, well, that tends to generate a very self-absorbed infantile posture toward life. It also tends to generate uh, dynamics that he says are very separating and alienating within our society. So, you know, people get sort of banded together insofar as we are banded together under the full freedom assumption into, uh, you know, separate little enclaves and groups of self-interest. Not that this would be happening in the 21st century, because it really obviously is much more so even than when he was writing. So, uh, I think I think that's pretty obvious. I hope it's obvious at any rate that, you know, because man, you know, 21st century, we are at each other's throats along almost any dimension you can think of. Uh, gender divides, racial divides, religious divides, political divides. Well, isn't there something a little bit strange about all that, a little bit juvenile about all of that? It's like me, me and my buddies, me and my club, and you can't be in the club, na 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 bo bo na 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 bo bo yeah. All right. An infantile, juvenile vision of what life is about. Okay. So, and the problem there, according to Rollo May, is that, of course, it impedes uh, social evolution and the betterment of our world. Aside from that, it works out just great. And incidentally, that is sarcasm. Okay. So first problem, first distortion in the meaning of freedom, the full freedom assumption. Okay. Next one, distrust of freedom. So the way to learn these quickly is to, when you realize that the full freedom assumption is really the opposite of the distrust of freedom. Okay, so this is an easy way to remember them in case I ask you about them on a test, and by the way, I will, assuming you're my student. All right, so distrust of freedom, in which uh, people are seen as incapable of exercising adult freedom and adult responsibility and by people I mean adults, okay? People need to be taken care of at some level because we just can't take care of ourselves. Well, why is that? Because you can't trust us with a, a real actual adult range of freedom and a real actual adult range of responsibility. And I'm trying to make a silly face as I say it because there is something kind of silly about it. Like if you don't sort of force people, and usually what this means is legally force people uh, to do the right thing, that they are incapable of doing the right thing on their own uh, cognizance, you know. So uh, I threw out a few examples that hopefully are somewhat provocative of this uh, idea of distrusting freedom. Like, has it ever struck you as odd that you're not free, legally speaking, to decide your own state of consciousness via consciousness altering drugs and uh okay at this point maybe you're you're about ready to uh throw your computer into the trash because you don't like what i'm saying hey this is not a video advocating drug use this is a video critiquing our attitude toward drug use okay so um, so the idea here, in light of the distrust of freedom is that if we didn't make all of that kind of stuff illegal Pretty much everyone, let's say you, for example, you, the YouTube <laughs> audience, would pretty much be go down to your uh, neighborhood shady area and uh, you know buy up some crystal meth or perhaps some black tar heroin, name your poison, and you'd pretty much be booting up smack every day if we didn't make it illegal. Whereas I think here's the actual reality. Can we get real here for a second? Here's the actual reality. Anyone who really wants to do that is going to find a way of doing it whether it's legal or not, okay? Like if you're into that kind of stuff, you're gonna find a way to it. Now people who are not into that, like myself, I'm not into that, all right? Even if they made it legal tomorrow, completely legal, we're still not gonna do it. In other words, uh, the question that I might invite you to wonder about is what is the law really about? Because it's probably not about preventing people who want to do it from doing it. Because the obvious reality is, if you want to do it, you're going to find a way of doing it. And it's not about keeping people who don't want to do it from doing it, because they're not going to do it anyhow. So what's the law about? What is the war on drugs about, basically? And I think, uh, and, you know, the, the disquieting 
realization is the war on drugs is really a war on your sense of yourself as a free and responsible agent because power does not want you to think of yourself that way because the more able you are to think of yourself that way and live your life that way the less beholden you are to power the less dependent you are on power telling you how how to live how to think what to feel what behaviors you're going to engage in or not but i think the deeper reality in the case of drugs with with occasionally there's a counter example but for the vast majority of people is you're perfectly capable of deciding for yourself how you want to live your life. I know, just a wild thought, assuming you're an adult, of course. All right, so um, uh, similar thing with prostitution. It's like, well, we have laws against prostitution because, you know, without those laws there, you would be running, not walking, to your local bordello in order to... Um, okay, let's, let's try to say this in a polite way to... Uh, uh, satiate yourself. How about that? Satiate yourself sexually. Well, you're not free to do that. You're not free to buy and sell sex or anything like that, except for, you know, occasional isolated provinces you can, but for the most part you can't. Because, you know, without the laws there, we can't really trust you be to be free enough and responsible enough for yourself to decide for yourself if you're going to do that. The war, once again, isn't really about sex. It's about your personal liberties, okay? Your sense of yourself as a deeply free and deeply responsible agent. That's what the war is about, okay? Uh, oh, the next one is sort of a dinosaur thing, and probably you guys who are my students who are about 20 years old probably wouldn't be able to relate to this, but back in the day, in the Pleistocene epoch, when I grew up, if you went to a motel and the motel had a swimming pool, odds were extremely good that it would also have a diving board there. Well. We had to take out all the diving boards out of all the pools, out of all the motels across the United States. Why is that? Because someone got hurt somewhere. And if one person can't handle the freedom to have a diving board in a motel, the obvious solution is that no one in the nation should be allowed to stub their toe at the diving board, <laughs> at the pool, at your local m motel. And once again, um, the idea here is that uh, what I'm trying to flash you onto with these examples is like, how much do you have to distrust people's practice of their personal freedom and personal responsibility before you start trying to legislate away all of these things like drugs and sex and diving boards and lawn darts, which was a game that we had once again back in the day, which was kind of dangerous. It had these sort of uh, heavy uh, darts that sort of flew up high and they came down fast and I'm sure someone got hurt playing with this so because someone got hurt but some, because someone couldn't handle the freedom to have their own lawn dart game uh, no one in the country is capable of that right <laughs> and i'm hoping as i go through these you begin to sort of suspect what you might just take for granted uh, ultimately you're not free to decide whether you live or die and this is referring to uh, laws against suicide now I've, I understand that they've retracted some measure of these but for a while there were laws in place to prohibit you from committing suicide so that if you actually did commit the crime of committing suicide they would probably what would they do they'd send like the karma police after you karma police arrest this man okay so um, you're not free to decide whether you live or die. Well, isn't that kind of an odd thing? Because once again, the reality is that um, if you decide you're not, you don't want to live anymore, there's not much stopping you. There's not much stopping you. It doesn't take much. It's not rocket science. It takes a belt, piece of rope, that's about it. <laughs> or a high height, possibly. Okay, so what's the law about once again? Well, it's probably not about, you know, who, who is it that really wants to commit suicide but then uh, looks up the legal code about it and discovers, oh, there's a legalistic prohibition against my committing suicide. I guess I have to live out the next year, 60 years of my life in abject misery. It's like no one is prevented. Once again, the law isn't about that. The law is about something else. And I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm being sort of a nasty, uh, this is a nasty lecture. I'm inviting you to become suspicious of things that you might uh, just take for granted as being, you know, expressions of altruism running throughout our cultural terrain. Well, you know, maybe they're not quite as altruistic as they seem at first. Maybe they're more about controlling you and hemming you in and actually making you feel a much more diminished sense of personal freedom and personal responsibility than you might otherwise. 
Okay, so at the end of this section, Rollo May, if that's not enough for you, also asks, could therapy be a form of social control? Psychotherapy at some level, like getting people to be well adapted to the prevailing conventions of society so that you can do things like hold down a job and feed the power structures that are out there, could at some level uh, what seems to be the altruism of psychotherapy, which at points I'm sure is very altruistic, be uh, also a form of social control? Interesting question, especially if you're interested in starting to work clinically. You don't want to, man, you don't want to fall into a job and find out that, uh, like all appearances to the contrary, you ended up being part of the police force. You know, that's not what you want to be. So, all in all, according to Rollo May, there's a new there's a need for a new understanding of basic human freedom and responsibility in light of the prevalence of these kinds of systemic distortions in the meaning of freedom and responsibility. And such a new understanding would include, um, well, basically what it boils down to is understanding what we are. Understanding what being human is about, right? Because if all you do is substitute one more or less arbitrary definition of the word freedom and responsibility for another more or less arbitrary and distorted uh, definition of those terms, you're probably not going to make too much progress. So really, what we need to do is understand ourselves, okay? So it's a project of self-awareness. It's a project of awakening to reality. You getting it? Like we, what, he, what he's really calling for is a kind of awakening to reality. And on that basis, uh, beginning to recast and uh, re-envision what we think freedom and responsibility are. So attributes of that awakening process. An acute awareness of self-world, hyphenated, as though they belong together. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So wow, big, you know, important existential theme, if you didn't know that. Okay, so an acute, sharp, cutting, deep awareness of self-world, like what it really means for you to be alive in this universe, okay? Hence a willingness to transcend the strictures of the immediate situation, because part of what we are is beings that at least have the capacity to transcend ourselves, and sometimes we really do. Sometimes we really develop. Sometimes we really grow in who and what we are. So understanding the reality of that and how it happens would be important to re-envisioning what freedom and responsibility are too. So the next thing he sort of does is he talks a little bit about psychotherapy and the implications uh, for all of this on psychotherapy. Now he'll return to that at the end of the chapter, but for now just to run in parallel with it. So psychotherapy is not going to be about things like drives and analyzing your drives. And here he's sort of picking on psychoanalysis or at least the older Freudian version of psychoanalysis for for this because here's the thing about drives like you may be driven in various ways like you have probably a hunger drive and a sex drive and who knows what other kinds of drives you have going on in your life but it's always a function of your freedom what you do with what is driving you whether you resist it or not and the fact of the matter is you can resist a lot of things that we code as drives at least for a while you know, or whether you channel it in a different way, well, that's a function of your decisions too, like how you channel uh, the various impulses that you would think of in terms of drives as a function of your freedom too. So, <laughs> you know, therapy is not so much about figuring out the drive, your drives and what's driving you so much as it is figuring out how you're choosing a relation to what is driving you. Okay, so you may be more powerful than it seems like at first. Just a thought, all right? Even if you're 20 years old, let's say that again. Even if you're 20 years old, you may be a lot more powerful than you think at first. And I know it's easy for you to think of yourself as not very powerful because you're still a student and you haven't, being a student is a weird sort of penumbra phase of life. Uh, penumbra, let's improve your vocabulary, sort of a shadow-like phase of life. Um, because it's like, well, you're probably out of the house, uh, but you're not quite on your own earning a wage and paying your bills and all that. You're somewhere in the middle uh, of that. But even so, you may be way more powerful than you think. Okay, so think about that for a second, all right? So there, okay, more, more um, implications for psychotherapy. So, uh, it, psychotherapy also is not fundamentally about analyzing your conditioning. Now this is an idea, a way of picking on behaviorism, so the drives is a way of picking on psychoanalysis. 
uh, his critique of conditioning uh, is a critique of behaviorism, sort of a behavioristic approach to therapy. So uh, once again, it's obvious that you're conditioned in various ways, okay? So the truths of behaviorism are there for sure, but no matter how you've been conditioned, once again, it's a function of your practice of freedom, whether you acquiesce to how you've been conditioned, whether you resist it, whether you decide you're going to do something else, even if it's really difficult for you to do. Okay, so in a way, your freedom is the lens through which all of the light of your conditioning must pass through in the first place. So therapy has to do with, it must have to do with, enlarging, enlarging I'm sorry, the consciousness of freedom, expanding your consciousness along this terrain of freedom and responsibility. Okay, so you're, and by the way, when we're speaking about responsibility, maybe I should say this, because we're using that term a lot, like the way that these uh, humanistic psychologists are talking about responsibility, the way to really hear it is to break the word apart and turn it backwards, okay? So responsibility is really about your ability to respond to the world, to life, okay? So it's really about your world engagement, because sometimes people use that word responsibility and what they mean is obey me, like you better be responsible. What that really means is you need to obey me. That's not how they're using this word in this instance. They're using it to denote your ability to respond. That's your responsibility, your ability to respond to the world, okay? So principles of freedom, a few principles of freedom, and then he's gonna end the chapter with another uh, few insights into psychotherapy. So three of them, not too many. So uh, number one, freedom is a quality of the centered self. All right, so this is getting at the question of what part of you is really free? Because one way of thinking about freedom is in terms of something like free will. Okay, this is a traditional idea about, you know, what part of us is really free. Or uh, free your mind and the rest will follow. <laughs> A little line from popular culture, I suppose. Or your ego, like your egoistic awareness is the part of you that makes choices. Well, hopefully you're able to anticipate at this point in the semester that none of these parts of you is gonna be the part that is free, but rather freedom is going to be all about integrating everything that you are, that that's what you choose with, the sum total integration of all that you are. So uh, freedom is a quality of the centered self, the self acting as a totality. And this should not shock you. This should not shock, I hope this, well, if it does shock you, learn it now. Because uh, if you learn nothing else in this class, this might be the lesson, the lesson of holism. Okay, so number two, freedom always involves social responsibility. Hopefully by, this is not a surprise either by this point in this video. It's not just about doing whatever you want, whenever you want it. That is actually an illusion, okay? That is not your freedom. That is an infantile illusion. It's about responding to the inevitable limits of life, which are myriad, but which include things like uh, limits having to do with your body, okay, your bodily side of your existence, uh, your intelligence, uh, social structures in which you inhabit, the historical period in which you uh, inhabit, and so on. There are many different limitations to your freedom. That doesn't mean that you're not free. In fact, <laughs> it means that you are free to choose your response to all of that. You may not be in the body you want to be in, but you're free to decide how you, what your response is going to be to being in your particular body. You may wish that you were born in another historical period, but you know, just wishing isn't going to do much about it. You know, <laughs> you're free to respond to the fact that you're living in the 21st century, though, and you can do that in an infinite number of ways. Okay, so uh, your freedom. Okay, another observation about that under number two: freedom isn't about freedom from conditions you don't like. That's not the deep meaning of your freedom, although at some level it is part of it, but that's not the deep meaning of your freedom. It's like, well, my freedom is about uh, my capacity to get rid of stuff I don't want in my life. Well, yeah, but what's the real meaning of your freedom? Well, the real meaning of your freedom is, like I said a second ago, like your ability to respond to life, your responsibility, your ability to gear into the world you know, to respond to the universe, to respond to this, this weird, bizarre, terrifying, and wonderful mystery into which you have apparently been thrown somehow. Your freedom is about responding to all of that. So it's about engage, it's, about, it's not about freedom from, 
It's about freedom for. Okay, let's repeat that. It's not about freedom from, like conditions you don't like. It's about freedom for engaging the realities of the world. That's the deep meaning of your freedom, to gear into the world more powerfully. All right, so number three, this part in the book. So freedom requires the capacity to accept, bear, and live constructively with anxiety. Okay, so uh, this is another theme within existential thinking, that freedom and responsibility always come with some measure of anxiety. Life is an anxious thing, okay, in any number of ways. And in, in, if you're not convinced of that, like consider how unpredictable your mortality is. Okay, so your death point. We're talking about your death point. Consider how quickly and unpredictably you can no longer exist. All right? And it can happen very quickly, you know, and I bet some of you young people know this because you've seen other people die, right? So it can happen very quickly, very unpredictably. In other words, like because of that, there's a certain irreducible fraction of anxiety. Well, you know, free freedom also entails a certain irreducible fraction of anxiety because, you know, when you're free and responsible for your life, all of a sudden you're the one determining the quality of it or the lack of quality of it. You getting it? So there, that's a certain kind of weightiness, a certain kind of anxious weightiness. Well, as oh my goodness, like I'm free enough to destroy my life or live a crappy life, but also live a brilliant, wonderful life too. Well, if the weight of that responsibility is really resting on your shoulders, along with that comes a certain measure of normal anxiety, not neurotic anxiety. Okay, this is normal anxiety, constructive anxiety. That's part of life. Okay, so. If we take away your normal anxiety, in a way, we simultaneously take away part of your humanity. You getting it? Because to be human is, at points, to be anxious. All right? It's a rational response to the uncertainty and unpredictability and the vagaries of life and how strange it all is and <laughs> all of that. You know, So uh, a certain measure of anxiety is inevitable if you're going to be human. So to, he says, okay, so let's quote Rollo May. To be free means to face and bear anxiety. To run away from anxiety means automatically to surrender one's freedom. Now, uh, this, is, um, this is what demagogues are so great at. Like if you want to use your knowledge of psychology, suppose you're a psychology major and your career aspiration is to be a, a third world demagogue somewhere. Well, this is, this is right out of the demagoguery 101 playbook. It's like, yeah, how do you become a demagogue? Well, uh, become good at naming and describing people's fundamental anxiety and promise to take it away. Promise to take it away. I feel your pain. I feel your pain. I know how you struggle from moment to moment. I know how hard your life can be sometimes. And then offer some grandiose scheme for taking it away, you know. <laughs> So uh, demagoguery, drugs, drugs, this is part of the appeal of drugs too, especially the type that shut down your consciousness, right? Not expand your consciousness, but the type that shut it down. Um, because it lessens your anxiety by introducing a, a neurotoxin into your central nervous system. Yeah, if you, if you sort of, you know, jangle your synaptic responses hard enough, you're not going to feel anxiety, but the problem is that, you know, you're probably not going to be free, not very free or responsible either when you're, you know, uh, you know, when you steep yourself in heroin long enough, you know, so not really choosing. Why? Because your life is all about the drugs and nothing else and not really responsible. Why? Because you're too zoned out to be responsible too. So, uh, Again, a quote, taking away the person's anxiety, we also take away his opportunity to learn. Okay, so taking away your anxiety means taking away also your opportunity to learn and grow. This is why in addictions treatment, very often it's common in addictions treatment to see the person stuck in whatever developmental stage they were when the addiction started. Well, why is that? Because when the addiction starts, what stops is your capacity to learn, at least any, in any deep sort of way, to grow in your humanity. All right, so uh, if, you, if you become an addict as a teenager, pretty much you're going to be an emotionally there, let's say, till you, for the next 20 years, till you're 40 years old, and eventually you try to work past your addiction. Well, you're going to be emotionally.
Okay, camera went off again. So I was helping you sort of flash on to an insight from addictions treatment, very common observation that, you know, when an, a person's addiction starts, that's when their, their growth and their development as a human being stops and it will stay stopped until they work their way out of the addiction. All right, so taking away a person's anxiety like drugs can do, drugs can do that. We also take away his opportunity to learn. Anxiety is the sign of inner conflict. Okay, so anxiety is a marker of inner conflict. And so long as there is conflict, some resolution to a higher plane of consciousness is possible. Okay, so inner conflict is not your enemy. Anxiety is not your enemy. In a way, it's your friend because it's precisely by way of your anxieties and your, your inner turmoil that you can grow and you can learn and you can pass through things that seem to, to freak you out and stuff like that. So, and finally, the last observation, and this one may be the most powerful of them all in this section, freedom is something you grow into. Okay, so, um, the reason why this is powerful is because most of the time we don't assume that this is true. Most of the time we assume that, well, especially here in the United States where we love to talk the language of freedom. Remember, when we, when we, uh, when we are really loud and um, insistent on things, that's a marker of what we have not yet attained. Okay, so you need to start to hear with therapists here a little bit, even if you're only a junior in psychology or thereabouts. So, uh, you know, when people are, are really insisting really loudly and braying really loudly about something and proclaiming it as their value and, and so on, that's a sure sign that they have not yet resolved the struggle. Okay? They want you to think they have because they want themselves to think they have, but they really haven't. Okay? So, all right. So, uh, freedom is something you grow into. So, when we speak in bray really loud about freedom, that means it's something we have not quite mastered somehow. In other words, it's an acquired taste. So an acquired taste means, this is a phrase, this might be a little old school these days. So uh, an acquired taste is something, it's like foods or something like that, that they talk about foods this way. It's like certain foods you're probably not going to like at first, odds are. But if you stay with them long enough, you'll eventually grow to like them. Well, freedom is kind of like that. You're probably not going to like how it feels to be free and responsible as an adult. It's probably not going to feel all that good because, you know, you're free to uh, uh, pay your bills or not, but you're also responsible for paying your bills or not. And if you decide that you're going to use your freedom not to pay your bills, not to pay your bills, well, guess what? You're free to sleep under bridges at night, too. All right, so that can be a, um, a difficult sort of thing that maybe you won't like the reality of that at first. But if you hang with it long enough, you might develop a taste for it. You might grow to really like it and really enjoy it and it can make life seem so adventurous, you know, precisely because of the weight you're carrying to determine the quality of your existence. Okay, so, all right, two little sections. Markers of freedom. So, like, what does freedom look like? Um, when, let's say, uh, you observe it in the people around you, which, by the way, is a relatively rare thing. Like, to encounter souls that are free in a deep and genuine sense and also responsible in a deep and genuine sense in our world, it's relatively rare, okay? Most people are just going through the motions. Most people are either sort of deferring to some combination of those two primary distortions of freedom that we talked about in the beginning. So, to find someone who is really fundamentally free it's an interesting thing to encounter such a person or possibly be such a person, just a thought. Okay, so what does it look like? Playing a part in the decisions of larger groups. Okay, so it's not just all about you. You getting it? Like you're knit into the world. The more free you are, the more knit into the world you are. So uh, playing a part in decisions of larger groups. Okay, so respect for rational authority. Okay, so Here's the thing about authority and authority figures. Sometimes they're rational and sometimes they are not. And that applies to our purported leaders at all levels. Also applies to people like teachers and professors. Sometimes our authority is rational and sometimes it is not. Okay? Just be real about that, right, for a second. So uh, you need to, part of your job as students is to ongoingly be gauging whether what authority figures are telling you really is worthy of your attention or not. Because sometimes it is, and sometimes you really should pay attention. And sometimes it is not, and you should definitely not pay attention. 
all right? So once again, freedom entails, wouldn't it be a less anxious world if you could trust every damn authority figure? Well, yeah, it would, but of course you'd sacrifice your freedom if you did that. So uh, responsibility, of course, is another marker of freedom, thinking and acting for the long-term welfare of the group. The other side of it, esteem for self as an individual of worth and dignity. Okay, so honoring the group, also honoring the individual. This is one of the paradoxes of the human dilemma, okay, that we're both individual beings and social beings simultaneously. Okay, so they're both important. Both of those are equally important, right? So, so esteem for the dimension of individuality, he is able, if need be, to stand alone. So if you cannot stand alone and disappoint other people in order to be true to yourself, you're not really free, okay? All you are is enslaved to other people's demands and desires, right? So you have to be able to stand alone even when it's hard to do, even when you have to disappoint other people, even if you have to anger other people to be true to yourself, you have to have that capacity if you're ever gonna lay claim to your fundamental human freedom. You have to cultivate that and acquire that taste for sometimes standing alone when you need to. Okay. So, uh, and finally, he's able to accept the anxiety, accept, embrace the suck sometimes. <laughs> All right. Sometimes you have to embrace the suck, accept the anxiety, which is inevitable, inevitable in our shaken world. Now he's writing this, um, I think about, uh, let's see, almost 50 years ago. So if the world was shaken, then, Think about how it is now in 2020 in the midst of the coronavirus, for instance. Our capacity to accept a certain measure of anxiety that goes along with that is fundamental to our freedom and our ability to respond. I'm turning the word backwards. Our ability to respond to the demands of life. Okay, so and finally I said he'll end this chapter with implications for psychotherapy. Okay, here it comes four things. I'm trying to talk fast because this video is already long enough. Freedom and responsibility always imply one another. Oh yeah, I kind of got that so far in this video. So therapy that enlarges freedom must also enlarge responsibility because you don't get one without the other. Okay. So if the goal of therapy is in some sense to enlarge freedom, you also, it also must enlarge responsibility. Number two, therapy involves enlarging the capacity to experience normal anxiety. Because as we've seen, without some capacity to experience normal anxiety, you're not going to be free. Man, you're going to be ruled by your fears and your anxieties and, and ghosts floating around you and all kinds of stuff, right? You're going to be enslaved to all of that. Uh, so number three, therapy must address the sphere of values because part of your freedom is you get to decide what you value and what you do not value. Okay, so therapy must necessarily, there's no such thing as value-free therapy is what he's getting at. So if you have this fantasy, well, you know, let's evolve a school of psychotherapy that somehow doesn't take people's values into account. Well, good luck with that. All right, so therapy must address the sphere of values as markers of social engagement. I think that follows logically from everything we've been saying today. And finally, four, therapy involves the clients coming into his or her own values. Okay, but this requires that the therapist acknowledge his or her own values. Okay, so it's not just the client coming into his or her own values and consequently his or her own orientation to life. The same is required of the therapist. Getting it? Because like if you're blind to how your values are shaping and influencing how you're present to your client, well, basically you won't know what you're doing as a psychotherapist. Like it's only insofar as you are able to become at least somewhat self-aware of these kinds of things that you'll be able to be of assistance to other human beings who are struggling. Well, struggling with life might be a way of putting it. So that's chapter 12. Uh, in the next video, we're going to go backwards a little bit. So, yep, yep, yes, yep, yep, yep. That's Gus going backwards to chapter eight out of the book. Till then, have a great day. Take care.